All right, so uh, welcome everyone. We are gonna be covering the upper extremity for osteology today. So what you're looking at here in the center and what's highlighted in the center is the axial skeleton, right? So the axial skeleton is the skull, it is the spine and it is the ribs. It includes the sacrum and coccyx. So pretty much everything that's in the center is the axial skeleton. So what we're gonna be looking at today is gonna to be the appendicular skeleton. And the appendicular skeleton, we will break up into an upper extremity or an upper limb and a lower limb. When we look at the uh, upper extremity, we're talking about everything, including the clavicle, the clavicle, the scapula, the humerus, the lateral forearm bone known as the radius, the medial forearm bone known as the ulna, and then the hand, which is broken down into the wrist bones. There are eight of them called carpals. Then we have five metacarpals, and then we have 14 phalanges. Okay, so that's how we'll break down today's lecture. Then we'll come back for another lecture and we will cover the lower limb or the lower extremity. And that includes the pelvis, the innominate bone, the femur, and then what would be analogous to the forearm would be the lower leg. And that is composed of the tibia and the fibula. And then much like the hand where we had carpals in the foot, we have tarsals. And much like the hand where we have metacarpals and phalanges in the foot, there are metatarsals and phalanges. Okay, so let's start with the upper extremity. And when we look up here, uh, let's start with some information we've already done. We've done the sternum, right? But the upper portion of it is known as the manubrium. Then you have the body of the sternum. And then what is missing was the xiphoid process down at the bottom. Then we could see a few ribs. We could see the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth and it looks like the seventh rib, those are true ribs because you could see they have their own individual and unique separate costo cartilage, their own cartilage that attaches to the sternum. That's what makes them true. We have this junction right here, which is referred to as the angle of Louis, also the sternal angle. And the reason why this sternal angle is so important, it's a palpatory landmark, which means when you can feel it in the same horizontal plane, in the same horizontal plane is the second rib. And once you locate the second rib, once you go down like one finger breath, you're at the second intercostal space, then the third rib and then the third intercostal space, and the fourth rib, and the fourth intercostal space. And counting these are important, especially if you're getting into healthcare or nursing, because sometimes you'll, they'll train you how to use a stethoscope, of course, and be able to listen, to listen to uh, lung sounds and breathing sounds. Okay, so we've covered the sternum, we did the ribs. Now what attaches to the sternum, especially to the manubrium? is this bone right here. And if you look at this bone, you'll see that not only does it attach to the sternum, but it also attaches to this bone here. And this bone is called the scapula. And the function of this bone, it's acting as like a strut. A strut holds two things apart. It separates them. So this strut bone is separating and keeping the scapula where it should be 
which is on the posterior thorax or the posterior rib cage. If this clavicle was not here or it broke, the pulling force of all the muscles on the front of your chest would pull your scapula away. It would abduct or protract the scapula giving you this very rounded, contoured, rounded shoulder type of appearance. So the clavicle is a very important bone. It's a major part of the shoulder girdle, right? You've heard of the pelvic girdle. So the shoulder girdle is made up of the clavicle and the scapula. The shoulder joint, when we talk about the shoulder joint, we're talking about the junction between the humerus and the scapula where the humerus and the scapula come into contact, that specific articulation right here, the proximal part of the humerus is called the head of the humerus. And this part of the scapula, that is this concavity, is called a glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa. So the junction between this glenoid cavity and the head of the humerus is called the glenohumeral joint. So the glenohumeral joint is the main shoulder joint that moves the shoulder in a variety of positions. And you should go to my YouTube channel and make sure you subscribe and watch my video on range of motion because one of the things that you will be responsible for doing, especially uh, on, the next, on the third exam, is when we cover muscles, is going to be, well, what does the muscle do? What is it, its action? And rather than memorizing shoulder flexion, shoulder extension, shoulder internal rotation, it's really important to have a visual of what those ranges of motion look like. So there's an old video that I did there. It's gotta be at least 10 years old. Um, it was done on a flip camera before uh, smartphones even existed, but it still captured the essentials. Uh, I am performing all the ranges of motion. I even discuss some of the main muscles that do it. It's important to, to understand those, to be able to visualize them as well. All right, so when we look at the clavicle, we'll see that there's a medial component to it, and then there's a lateral component to it. Now, the medial component forms a joint, and so does the lateral portion form a joint. So you could see here, the medial portion is called the sternal end, and then the lateral portion is called the acromial end. Why is it called the acromial end? Well, this part of the scapula is called the acromion process. And you can see that there is an articulation or a joint that forms between the acromion process and the facet for the articulation with the acromion, which is here. So this joint is called the AC joint, the acromial clavicular joint, AC joint. This joint here between the sternum and the clavicle, right? Here is the sternal end and there is a sternal facet. Remember a facet is nothing other than a smooth flat surface like the facet of a diamond is used for the junction of the medial aspect of the sternum to the the medial aspect of the clavicle to the sternum. So they call this the sternoclavicular joint. AC joint, sternoclavicular joint. Okay. The clavicle is one of the most commonly fractured bones in the body. And when it does fracture, it fractures right here in the center, right here in the center, where you have this concavity. Right? If you were to palpate and feel your own clavicle, you'll see that if you start at the jugular notch or the suprasternal notch and you start to move laterally, you'll see that the medial two-thirds 
is convex, meaning it bows outward anteriorly. And then the lateral one third is concave, it dips in. And that is a, a good understanding because when you find the deepest part of the concavity, which is right around here, you could see right there. So the medial two thirds, which is here is convex. And then the lateral third is concave. And if you go to the concavity, the deepest part, which would be here, and you drop down a few finger breaths, you hit this process of the scapula that's called the coracoid process. This is the acromion process, but this is the coracoid. And the coracoid is an important landmark because there's several muscles that attach there. The pec minor attaches there and the coracobrachialis attaches here. It's an important landmark. Okay, let's move on. Here's just a close up view. I'll review everything I covered on this as well. Here's the jugular notch, also known as the suprasternal notch. Here is the sternal portion of the clavicle. And then here is the acromial facet. This is the acromion process. This is the acromioclavicular joint. This is the sternoclavicular joint, acromion process, coracoid process, head of the humerus, and glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity. Again, a close up view. This is the medial portion. Here's the sternal end. And then here is the lateral. Now, if you look, there's a, there's a difference between the appearance of them. On the lateral portion, it's broader and it's a little flatter, it needs to be. This is in comparison, this is a little bit more narrower. And also if you look at the lateral end, the concavity is shorter. This concavity is much, much wider on the sternal end. This is just showing the, when you look here, this is the superior view looking bird's eye view. And when you look at it from the inferior view, there are some roughened surfaces like the conoid tubercle and costal tubercle. These are attachment sites for ligaments. There are ligaments that go from the ribs up until the clavicle to hold it in place. But those are on the inferior surface. Okay, conoid tubercle is more lateral and the costal tubercle is more medial. Okay, let's look at the scapula next. Now, it looks like there's a lot to do here and there is, so let's help organize and understand the different landmarks that you find here. Now, first thing you have to do is when you look at the, at the scapula, you'll see on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, you're looking at it, one is from the anterior view and one is from the posterior view. And the first thing you have to do when looking at the scapula, because on an exam, you may be asked, is this the left or right scapula? You will have to identify, oh my gosh, right? I have to know the anatomical position. So I know the orientation of this. So when you look at it, you'll see that there is a major difference between the left-hand side, which is looking at the scapula from the anterior view, and the right-hand side looking at the scapula from the posterior view. Notice the posterior has this large structure that interrupts the entire body. Whereas you're looking on the anterior side, it's a full smooth surface it's nice and clean and open. So if you do not see this spine of the scapula, now on an exam, if you're asked this structure, do not put spine. It says spine here, but spine to me sounds like the vertebral column. So if you're ever asked this structure, the appropriate and most complete answer that you can give is spine of the scapula. That's exactly what it is. Spine of the scapula. 
not just spine. Make note of that. Now, this is the scapula from the posterior side. Now, this is the medial border, and this is the lateral border. So we have a medial border, and we have a lateral border. When you look at the lateral border, at the superior part of it, that's where this is, the glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity, right? This is where your humerus is going to articulate. So it would only make sense that this is the lateral border because your arm, right, your humerus is lateral. It can't articulate over here on the medial side. That would be ridiculous. So it's here on the lateral side. So there are three borders to the scapula. We did the medial border. Here's the lateral border. And then there's a superior border. Okay, if we look at it from the anterior side, same thing. This is the medial border. This is the lateral border. Again, the same side as the glenoid cavity. And here is the superior border. Easy enough. There happens to be three angles, right? So there's three borders, and now we're gonna cover three angles. On the top, on the left, we could see that there is a superior angle. All the way on the bottom, inferior angle. And on the lateral side, a lateral angle. So we've covered three borders, superior border, medial border, and lateral border, and we covered three angles. Superior angle, inferior angle, and the lateral angle. So far, so good. Now we're gonna look at th uh, one, two, three, four fossas. Okay, so there are three borders, three angles. Let's look at the four fossas. Remember a fossa is a nice smooth depression and everywhere you see a fossa, at least three of the four places, is gonna be muscles that attach. And the muscles that are going to attach there are the four rotator cuff muscles. So in order to name them, let's start with the spine of the scapula on the posterior side. So this is the spine of the scapula and you'll notice what it does from the medial border, it starts to move superiorly as we're moving laterally, right? It moves, it forms this diagonal. So the medial portion is more inferior. And then as you start moving laterally, it goes superior. Okay. The other thing that I didn't mention that I want to remind you is that the medial border, which is here, here's the medial border. It's also known as the vertebral border because it's closer to the vertebral column. And then the lateral border, which is here, is known as the axillary border because it's closer to the axilla, which is the armpit. So the medial border is AKA vertebral border and the lateral border is also known as the axillary border because it's closer to the armpit. Okay, now let's go back and let's look at the fossas. So we found the spine of the scapula. What is the fossa above it? Well, the term supra means above. So this is the supraspinous fossa. This is the infraspinous fossa. Supraspinous means above the spine of the scapula. Infraspinous means below the spine of the scapula. All right, so supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa. Underneath, on the other side of the scapula or underneath or on the ventral or anterior side is the subscapular fossa. This is the largest fossa because it's this entire thing, okay? Now, 
don't worry about body and body. Forget about that term. I think it's confusing because if you're ever asked, what is this on an exam? You're not going to say body. You're going to say subscapular fossa. If you're ever asked, what is this on an exam? You're not going to say body. You're going to say infraspinous fossa. Okay. That's what they're going to be asking or looking for are the names of the fossas, not so much body. Now, there are four rotator cuff muscles and they're called sits, S-I-T-S, -S, sits. The first S is for the supraspinatus muscle. Where do you think the supraspinatus muscle is going to originate? On what fossa? The supraspinatus muscle originates on the supraspinous fossa. The infraspinatus muscle originates on the infraspinous fossa. So supraspinatus originates here, infraspinatus originates here. Subscapular, which is the last, the fourth rotator cuff muscle, originates here on the subscapular fossa. So this would be the sub uh, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and the subscapularis. So the subscapularis muscle, the subscapularis muscle originates on the subscapular fossa. Okay, the fourth muscle I didn't yet mention. So you had supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. We covered three. The fourth is the teres minor. That originates here, not on a fossa. It originates on the lateral border. Okay, so those are the three fossas. There's one more. So we did the supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa, and the subscapular fossa. Where's the fourth fossa? The fourth fossa is this, it's the glenoid cavity. The glenoid cavity is also referred to as the glenoid fossa. That's where the head of the humerus articulates with. Okay, so we did what? Three borders, three angles, four fossas. Now we have a few, we have two processes. There's, remember I said the spine of the scapula as it moves superior and lateral? Well, the highest part of that structure is the acromion process, which you can see here from the anterior view on the left. And you can also see it on the posterior view on the right. That's the acromion process. What's the significance of that? That's where the clavicle or the lateral clavicle articulates. Here is the coracoid process. This is where your pec minor attaches. This is where your coracobrachialis attaches. And this is where the short head of the biceps attach. So there's three muscles that attach to the coracoid process. And it's important because some people say, oh, I have shoulder pain. You go, well, where is it? And they go, it's right here. Right, and then you're thinking, all right, what attaches there? There's the pec minor, there's the coracle brachialis, and the short head of the biceps brachii. That's the importance of knowing anatomy, structure, function. Okay, uh, two tubercles. So there were two processes and there's two tubercles. They don't show them too well, but remember how there was a supraspinous fossa and an infraspinous fossa? There's also a supraglenoid tubercle and an infraglenoid tubercle. Remember, this is the glenoid cavity. Oh, here it is. Yeah, that does show it here on the top. So here's the supraglenoid tubercle right there at the top. And right at the most inferior aspect of it, there would be an infraglenoid tubercle. What's the significance of the two, those two tubercles? The supraglenoid tubercle is where the long head of biceps attaches. And the infraglenoid tubercle is where the long head of the triceps attaches. So biceps, triceps, biceps, triceps, long head, long head. Okay, let's move to just the individual view. 
to review it. We're looking at the scapula. Again, this is the anterior side. How do we know? Well, we do not see that spine of the scapula. So this is anterior view. So now which scapula would this be? I'm gonna give you a chance to think about it. Is this the left or the right? So how we think about this is we would say, well, here's the smooth surface. The posterior side is on the back. Here's the glenoid cavity. This is the lateral border. So the head of the humerus is here. So this is anterior, this is lateral. This would have to be the right, the individual's right scapula. And again, notice if there is a line pointing anywhere on this anterior surface, you don't put body, you put subscapular fossa. That's where the subscapularis muscle attaches. Let's do the three borders. Well, we've already established that here's the glenoid cavity, which is lateral. So this is the lateral border. This is the medial border. And this is the superior border. Here is the superior angle, inferior angle, lateral angle. Also, medial border is known as the vertebral border. Lateral border is known as the axillary border. Two processes, coracoid process, acromion process. When we look at it from the lateral view, here is the concavity. So this is gonna articulate with the ribs. Here's the anterior or ventral side. This is the posterior side. So here's the coracoid process projects anteriorly. Here's the posterior spine of the scapula and the acromion process. Glenoid fossa, supraglenoid tubercle, infraglenoid tubercle. From the posterior view, again, vertebral border, axillary border, superior border, superior angle, inferior angle, lateral angle. Infraglenoid tubercle right there at the bottom, supraglenoid we can't see. Spine of the scapula. When we follow it up, a chromian process. Smooth surfaces now. Supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa. Supraspinatus originates here. Infraspinatus originates here. Teres minor originates here. The subscapularis originates here on the subscapular fossa. Okay, moving down, next bone is the humerus. Humerus is a pretty long bone. It's got several landmarks that are important to it. And again, you have to be able to identify a few structures to know medial versus lateral. Now, one of the first things that you, there's two things that you can identify quickly that will let you know which way we're looking at the humerus. One of them is the head of the humerus. Now, remember the head of the humerus is gonna project medially because it's going to articulate with the glenoid fossa that projects laterally. So the head has to point in to attach to the glenoid cavity that's pointing out. All right, so the first thing you have to be able to look at is the head of the humerus. And again, that projects medially. Why is this important? Because if you ever asked which humerus left or right, you can figure it out. The other important feature is down at the bottom, you'll see that there is a medial and a lateral epicondyle. Here is the medial epicondyle, and it's much more pronounced. If you've palpated on yourself in anatomical position, 
your medial epicondyle of your elbow is much more palpable and prominent than the lateral epicondyle. So this is your medial epicondyle. And here on the outside is the lateral epicondyle. So again, medial and lateral epicondyle, which one is more pronounced than medial epicondyle? If this is medial, then you should look at the head of the humerus, that is medial. They both project in the same manner. Okay, the next thing to be able to identify at the distal end is, okay, do I have any fossas here? Because on the anterior or ventral side, there are two fossas. And on the posterior side, there's only one fossa. So again, these are key ideas. These are key structures that help you differentiate between the left side and the right side. Look at the fossas and look at the head of the humerus and look at the medial epicondyle, right? The medial epicondyle is medial, the head of the humerus is medial and keep in mind on the ventral or anterior side at the distal end, there's two fossas. There's a coronoid fossa and there is a radial fossa. Now, what are these two fossas for? The coronoid fossa and radial fossa? Well, if we zoom in here, you'll see that at the elbow, at the distal end, distal end of the humerus, there's the radial bone, which is the lateral bone. Just remember the thumb radiates out. If your thumb radiates out in anatomical position, if the thumb radiates out on that outside is also the radial bone. The medial bone is the ulnar. When the elbow bends into flexion, when you bend your elbow full into flexion, this structure here, which is the head of the radius, articulates with the radial fossa. Okay, the head of the radius goes with the radial fossa on extreme flexion. On the proximal ulna, there's a part called the coronoid process. On the proximal ulna, there is a process called the coronoid process. The coronoid process is going to fit perfectly in the coronoid fossa with elbow flexion. Okay. All right, so let's go back. Head of the humerus and on the lateral side and anterior here, you're gonna see these two roughened tubercles. One of them is called the greater tubercle and the smaller one will be called the lesser tubercle. And important to remember that on the humerus, there's a greater tubercle and a lesser tubercle because on the femur down here, on the femur, there's a greater trochanter and a lesser trochanter. So do not confuse the greater trochanter with the greater tubercle and don't confuse the lesser trochanter with the lesser tubercle. All right. Greater tubercle, lesser tubercle. And what is that groove? between the two tubercles, it's called the intertubercular group because it's between the two tubercles. Great, greater and lesser tubercle and between it is the intertubercular groove. This is also called the bicipital groove. Guess why it's called the bicipital groove? Well, it's called a bicipital groove because the long head of the biceps travels right through this groove. The long head of the biceps travels right through here, right? The biceps brachii muscle would be here in front of the arm. But the long head travels up here right through the groove and attaches to the supraglenoid tubercle. Aha, now you know why we're learning these landmarks. We're learning these landmarks because we're prepping you for muscles. In the next group of 
um, chapters that we'll be covering after our osteology is myology. And muscles move bones because muscles attach to the bones and they attach to these bones at very unique places. So besides the bicipital groove, the greater tubercle is the attachment site for three rotator cuff muscles. And the lesser tubercle is for one rotator cuff muscle. So the three rotator cuff muscles that attach to the greater tubercle, remember the rotators are sits, S-I-T-S, sits. The first three, supraspinatus, greater tubercle. And the last S for the subscapularis, that one is going to in on the lesser tubercle. Okay. So we have greater tubercle, lesser tubercle. The greater tubercle is for the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. The lesser tubercle is for the subscapularis. Okay, let's move on. Now, if we just look a little bit more inferior to that, we're now looking at the shaft of the humerus, right? That's the main portion. When you cover osteology and lecture, they'll talk about the epiphysis, the metaphysis and the diaphysis of long bones. So the shaft would be like the diaphysis. Okay, down at the distal end, down at the distal end, we have a medial epicondyle and a lateral epicondyle. Again, we said that the medial epicondyle was much more pronounced more evident. It stuck out more than the lateral epicondyle. Remember, there's also the coronoid fossa and radial fossa. So again, two fossas at the distal end of the humerus on the anterior side. Distal to that, then we have these two bony prominences that stick out here at the distal end. The one on the lateral side is the capitulum, and the one a little bit more medial is the trochlea. Now, again, what are these two for? The capitulum, if we look at the capitulum, you'll see that the capitulum is nice and round. Okay, it's nice and round. And why is it nice and round? Well, that capitulum is where the head of the radius is going to articulate. Whereas the trochlea right here is the perfect articulation for the part of the ulna, which we'll learn in a little bit, called the trochlear notch. So the ulna has a trochlear notch that's gonna articulate beautifully with the trochlea. The other importance and significance of the medial epicondyle is that is where all of your wrist flexors are going to articulate with. So if you put your hand on your medial epicondyle and you flex your fingers and bend your wrist, you're going to see movement along the medial epicondyle and that's because that's where all those wrist flexors and a lot of your finger flexors attach. Whereas on the lateral epicondyle side, that's where a lot of your wrist extensors attach. Why is this important? Because clinically, there are a lot of people that get golfer's elbow, that get pain here. And there's people that play, that get tennis elbow that have pain here. Tennis elbow is called lateral epicondylitis. Golfer's elbow is called medial epicondylitis.
Okay, let's look at the posterior side. Again, you could see the head of the humerus. Here's the greater tubercle. You can't see the lesser tubercle because that's more anterior. As we start to move down, you can see the medial epicondyle. You can see the lateral epicondyle. Here's the fossa. The fossa on the distal end is only one fossa on the distal end of the humerus. And that is called the olecranon fossa. Why is the olecranon fossa important? The olecranon fossa is important because on the posterior side, on the posterior side of the ulna, there is a process called the olecranon process. And much like the head of the radius fit in the radial fossa, the proximal ulna, which was the coronoid process, fits in the coronoid fossa. Well, on the posterior side, there's the olecranon process. And the olecranon process is going to fit perfectly into the olecranon fossa when the elbow is extended, okay? So one fossa on the distal posterior, two fossas on the distal anterior. Okay, so those are the major landmarks of the humerus. Let's look at the radius and ulna. Now on the radial and ulnar side, here on the left-hand side, we're looking at the posterior. On the right-hand side, we're looking at the anterior. So on the right-hand side, let's look at the proximal portion. There are some landmarks that I mentioned just before as I was talking about the fossas, the radial fossa, coronoid fossa, olecranon fossa. So what we see here on the left, top left, olecranon process. What we see here on the right, radial head. What we see here, coronoid process. So this, and what we see here is the trochlear notch. <laughs> so the radial head articulates with the radial fossa. The coronoid process articulates with the coronoid fossa. The trochlear notch, the smooth surface here on the upper right, articulates with the trochlea of the distal end of the humerus. And the olecranon process articulates with the olecranon fossa of the distal posterior humerus. Okay, what else do we have on the anterior side, on the right side of that picture? So, Here's the head of the radius. Distal to that is a radial tuberosity. This little bump is where your biceps brachii inserts. And notice between the radius and the ulna, there is a notch. It's called the radial notch. The radial notch is this concavity that is notched into the ulna. So the radial notch is actually on the ulnar side. There is an ulnar notch as well, but the ulnar notch is down here at the bottom and the ulnar notch is going to be on the radius. So again, head of the radius, radial tuberosity, radial notch, coronoid process, trochlear notch, and back here on the top is the olecranon process. The lateral of the two bones is obviously the radius. At the very end of the radius is a process called the radial styloid or styloid process of the radius. Radial styloid is sweeter. 
it's nicer, and it's only two words, radial styloid. On an exam, if you ever ask this, it's easier to write radial styloid instead of styloid process of the radius. It's just too much to write. Okay, let's see what else there is. Um, point of interest, notice the head of the radius is proximal. Well, where's the head of the ulna? That's not the head of the ulna. The head of the ulna is at the distal end. So you have the head of the ulna here, but you have the head of the radius up here. They're at opposite ends. And again, you have the radial notch up here on the ulnar side, but you have the ulnar notch here on the radial side. There's a ulnar styloid here, the radial styloid here. Okay, moving down and finishing up with the hand. So when we look at the hand, we'll see that we have the distal end of the radius and the distal end of the ulna that articulates with these eight small bones that are called carpal bones. Again, the thumb represents the first digit. The pinky represents the fifth. That's important because if you're ever asked any of these bones, you have to number them. So the thumb is one, the set the uh, pointer is two, the birdie is three, the ring finger is four, pinky is digit five. We're gonna name these eight bones here that are called carpals. I'll show you how to name the metacarpals and then the phalanges. So let's look and zoom in here. So this is the hand from the anterior. That's how you need to learn them because everything is learned from anatomical position. So when we look at the carpal bones, there are eight and we can break them up into two rows. There is a distal row and you'll see that there's four, one, two, three, four, right? One, two, three, four. And then there's four in the proximal row. One, two, three, which sits on top of four, right? You see the pisiform and the triquitrium. The pisiform, you can see like this little pebble is sitting right on top of the triquitrium. So there's a little silly mnemonic. There's a silly mnemonic that you can learn to remember the names of these four, uh, the four in the proximal row and the four in the distal row. There's eight total. And it's a silly mnemonic, goes back many, 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 many years. So you have to start this sentence starting from the proximal row on the lateral side. So you're starting at digit one. So see, we're gonna take the first letter of each of these bones and we're gonna make a sentence. So that sentence is some lovers try or try quitrium, some lovers try positions, pisiform, that they can't handle, right? Little silly, I know but a lot of students say that they can remember it very easily. What's the sentence again? Some lovers try positions that they can't handle. It is what it is. Okay, so if we take the first letter of each of those words, right? Some lovers try scaphoid, lunate, triquitrium, position, pisiform that they can't handle trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Easy enough. The hamate has a little extension. Uh, this is actually pointing to the hook of the hamate. There's a little hook and you can see it right here. But this bone is the hamate. 
what attaches to the third metacarpal is the capitate. Capitate, like capital, it is the largest one and it makes a perfect straight line. You'll see that the hamate articulates with the fourth and the fifth metacarpal. Trapezium with the first, trapezoid with the second. The one that dislocates or subluxates the most commonly is called the lunate. This lunate is the one that subluxates most commonly, means it can misalign and shift with, with hard falls, with an outstretched hand. And when the lunate subluxates, it puts pressure on a nerve called the median nerve that goes through the wrist. And that median nerve is involved with carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a compression of the median nerve within the wrist. There is a roof of the carpal tunnel and there's a floor of the carpal tunnel, a roof and a floor. When we have a roof and a floor, it makes a tunnel. The floor are these carpal bones. The roof is actually a ligament. And the ligament, if you think of like a watch band, how your watch goes across your wrist, the watch band goes, or the ligament goes from these two carpal bones to these two carpal bones. So it's called the transverse carpal ligament. The transverse carpal ligament, also known as the volar ligament, also known as the flexor retinaculum. So that ligament, like a watch band, that goes from the lateral wrist to the medial wrist. From here, lateral to medial. And underneath the roof is the floor the carpal bones, but between the roof and the floor is where the median nerve travels and all of your finger flexors travel. So if the finger flexors hypertrophy or they get larger due to overuse of the wrist and the fingers, the space in the tunnel is gonna get smaller. And if the space in the tunnel gets smaller because the soft tissue structures are getting larger, you get compression of the median nerve or if any of these carpal bones move or shift, they put pressure. And the one that moves or shifts is the lunate bone. The one that fractures most commonly is the scaphoid. And when the scaphoid fractures, you have pain at the proximal thumb joint right in here called the anatomical snuff box. That's called the anatomical snuff box, this depression right proximal to the first metacarpal and distal to the styloid process of the radius. This area right here, this depression is called the anatomical snuff box. Okay, so those are the eight carpal bones. Uh, the hook of the hamate and the pisiform are kind of important because there is a groove right here between the hook of the hamate and the pisiform and your ulnar nerve goes right through here. And sometimes if the ulnar nerve gets compressed, you get numbness and tingling to the pinky and to the half of the ring finger. But when the median nerve gets compressed, like in CTS, carpal tunnel syndrome, you get pain that goes to the first three and a half fingers. So the first goes numb, the second goes numb, the third goes numb, and half of the ring finger. Well, which half? Well, the half closer to the other three, of course. When the ulnar nerve gets compressed, you can go numb to half of the fourth and the fifth. Which half of the fourth? Well, the half that's closer to the fifth, of course. Okay, now let's finish up with what is distal to the carpals. What's distal to the eight carpals are called metacarpals. Okay, now the metacarpals, we could see here, metacarpal bones, one, two, three, four, five. This is from the posterior in anatomical position, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so what's after the carpals? Metacarpals, meta in Greek means after, like metamorphosis. 
the shift or the change that takes place after. So after the carpals are the metacarpals. Simply, if we were to put an arrow here and it said identify, and it's on the thumb, you would say first metacarpal or metacarpal one. If it pointed here, you would write second, right? Two ND, second metacarpal or metacarpal two. If on an exam you were asked the pinky one here, you would say five TH, fifth metacarpal, or you could write metacarpal five. Easy enough. So there's five metacarpals. All right, the last 12 bones are called phalanges. They're either called phalanges or phalanx, okay, whichever way you want. Phalange, there are 14 of them. Now let's start with digit two, three, four, and five. Notice that digits two, three, four, and five, they have one, two, three phalanges. One, two, three phalanges. One, two, three, one, two, three. So digits two through five all have three separate phalanges. But if we go to the thumb, right, we look after that first metacarpal, there's only one, two phalanges. Point of interest, okay? So now let's go and name these phalanges. If we go to here and we look at digit two, there is a proximal, a middle, and a distal phalange. A proximal, middle, and distal phalange. Proximal, middle, distal. Proximal, middle, distal. Proximal, middle, distal. To be specific on an exam, if you were ever asked, let's say this bone, you would have to say second, right? The number two, N, D, second, proximal phalange. If it pointed here at the very end, you would say second, two N, D, right? Second, distal phalange. If it pointed here to the birdie, right? To the third metacarpal, and then we pointed here, you would say third, three RD, right? Third, middle phalange, third distal phalange, third proximal phalange. So you have a proximal, middle, and distal phalange for digits two, three, four, and five. Well, what about the thumb? The thumb does not have a middle phalanx or a middle phalange. So it only has a proximal and a distal phalange or a proximal and distal phalanx. There is no middle. Okay, so if you're asked what is this on a test, you would say first, one ST, first proximal phalange. If you're asked this, first, right, one ST, first, distal phalange. That's an important concept when you look at it because a lot of students, they confuse this, especially the thumb. And they'll say, they'll know that this is the first metacarpal, second, third, fourth, fifth, because the metacarpals come after the carpals. But then several test questions later, if the student has ever asked any of these bones, they go, okay, well, this is the distal, this is the middle, this is the proximal. They confuse it. Make sure you don't make that mistake if it shows up on the exam. Okay. And this is the hand from the posterior view. How do we differentiate anterior from posterior? Because it looks so similar. Notice the carpal bones look very smooth on the posterior side, right? They look very, very smooth. But on the anterior side, there's the roughness. Why? Because you got the hook of the hamate that sticks out and you got the pisiform that sticks out. What is the pisiform? The pisiform, if you were to hold, let's say, a mouse pad on your desk, 
it's actually the pisiform that makes contact with the desk. So if your desk, and you can feel it, it's pretty prominent on the pinky side near that hypothenar pad. The thumb has the thenar pad, which is the muscles. The muscles of the pinky side are the hypothenar pad. So right there is where you find the pisiform. It is the most bony prominent part of the palm on the ulnar side. All right, a lot of people, when they lean on it too long, whether they're long distance cyclists, let's say they're biking long distances, or they're just leaning by holding a mouse all day, you can get compression of that ulnar nerve. Remember, the ulnar nerve passes here, it goes right through the pisiform and through the hook of the hamate. You can get numbness and tingling here. They call it ulnar nerve syndrome or ulnar nerve palsy. Right? It's like, it's like, a carpal tunnel syndrome, but a different nerve, right? Carpal tunnel is the median nerve. Ulnar nerve, when that gets compressed, you can get weakness and thinning of the muscles here, as well as numbness and tingling here. Median nerve gets you atrophy or wasting away of the muscles near the thumb, near the thenar pad, and it gives you numbness and tingling to the one, two, three and a half fingers. Okay. All right. I think that brings a close. So you have to remember, right? The some lovers try positions. You have to know. Remember that's from the anatomical position, which is always the anterior view. Proximal row from lateral to medial, and then distal row, lateral to medial. Okay. Let's stop the lecture here.